So here we are at Wapiti Park. Graham is doing his thing. He can entertain a lot of people and listen to how quiet they are. We did forget the box, that's why I'm coming back. And then I've got a couple more. Let's get them over in here. Yeah? Yeah, no? Okay. Sydney? Sydney always steps up. I'm liking Sydney. That's good. And RT, RT stepped up. Way to be, RT. In preparation for this trip, I have to give the students that stayed back a lesson plan with Miss Barney that covers the same sort of stuff that we're doing. And what I saw in looking at videos, stay with me, looking at videos that addressed water quality testing, many people are still using colorimeters, you know, where we put a, a reagent, they called it, but it's an indicator into the water and see how it changes and then measure it against the color. Are we indeed fortunate to have all this digital? Yeah. yeah, we are. Yeah. 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 No, the no, other yeah. stuff is much more difficult. It's and I, nothing ever got in the way of an Oregonian cutting down a tree. Uh, there is also a real threat to the fish that these, you know, these fellas as well as all of us love um, because, you know, what happens when, when you go through an area and you clear cut everything down to nothing? Get a lot of e erosion, which is going to increase our turbidity, which is going to cloud our water, which is going to suffocate our salmon eggs with, and our macroinvertebrates. Um, ultimately, even right here, you know, probably before this, you know, Wapiti Park was developed, it looked an awful lot like a lot like that dense forest, you know, with with no invasives like this blackberry around, and ultimately that really helped filter the system and create, you know, get rid of a lot of turbidity that, you know, after big heavy rain might have might have happened. So well, um, and with the dense forest right up next to it, does that keep the water cooler? Yeah, yeah. yeah. most certainly. And if it's cooler. Can it hold more dissolved oxygen? Yes, exactly. exactly. You betcha. That's, that's what our fish really need. That's what their, their eggs need. That's what that it all needs. So forestry, you know, is something that in our our area, you know, we need to really think about. Um, we really need to speak up about, you know, the forests that make our watershed so unique and beautiful. Um, not just, you know, the fact that this area does. I mean, we are in an area that grows trees faster than anywhere else on earth. So that's why, you know, sometimes timber can be cut, you know, extensively and heavily. For today's purpose, we're going to see if Drift Creek is still as healthy as it was last year. Um, we're going to see if indeed, you know, up above all that intact watershed is is still helping down here. Or maybe some of that, that extensive logging um, or poor logging from the private timber industries, maybe that has caused, you know, some water quality issues this year with these big rains. We will find out. Okay, and last year was the 19th of November that we came out here and did this. So this is going to be a sampling that we can compare, do a pretty good comparison to exactly. from, from last year. These guys are going to tell us a little bit about what we got. What did we get for our pH? Uh, 7.12. 7.12. What was our conductivity? Our <laughs> conductivity is 82. Okay. And then dissolved oxygen is 11.78. Yeah. They're going to get a percentage of dissolved oxygen right now, which is, that tells us uh, in the water how much oxygen is actually there. So what did you guys get? Uh, so reading 108.9. 108.9. So how is it possible that there could be 108% dissolved oxygen? There's more oxygen than there isn't. Uh, that's, that's good. So a river that has a lot of riffles, it has a lot of turning over. And what does that do? How, 
What does that do when, a wa when water goes over rocks and, and gets all, all rapid? It picks up oxygen. Picks up oxygen, exactly. So it literally folds the oxygen in. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna do flow rate. How fast, what, what part of the stream do you guys think is gonna be the fastest flowing? Do, in the deepest part or in the shallowest part? Shallow. I would imagine. Let's see what, what we find out. Jesse, you want to read it out to him? Point four nine eight meters per second. Meters per second. So that's our first measurement. So on the back of your paper, write that one down. Seven zero meters per second. Okay. Now look at that, guys. Even though it's deeper here, the water is actually flowing faster. So you guys thought it would be it would be faster when it was shallower, which is a good hypothesis. But in reality, now we're getting into where it's flowing faster because we're getting closer to the main channel. Six six zero. And that's ten. Same thing. Point six six zero. So we're at twenty. Yeah, we're at twenty now. Oops. You need her. Oh, can I play? Oh, 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 Okay. Now the one thing I what didn't do that I should have done is I should have also taken a stream measurement so we could look at how deep it actually was. But for this purpose, you can get a pretty good idea that, you know, it goes this to that. Any height on her? Uh, what's our average flow rate? Wait, did you get a different number, Mark? I, yeah, I did it. I got 0.5715. 0.5715? So the last thing I want us to look at is everybody Pick up a stone. I get the biggest one. All right. So, let me. I want everybody to hold up the stone they have. I get the biggest one. Yeah. Okay. So, this is a good example of some of the gravel size that some of our salmon are going to be looking for. So you can see in this region we have a variety of gravel sizes, but particularly most of the gravel in here is pretty big. So this is going to also be not only tell us about how much water is moving through here, but it also tell us about how, uh, how many types of fish can spawn in this area. So this gravel size is roughly about the size for what, Marjorie? Is it? Yeah. This is actually, so this is pretty good gravel size for Chinook, Chum, and maybe in some spots, Coho. But primarily this is Chum and Chinook size gravel. Um, because if it was, in, you know, smaller stuff, like when we go to Crowley Creek and we go to Mink Creek, that's going to be very different than this size. So I want you guys to get a look at how this, you know, is very large in here because of how much water is moving through here. So there's, you know, lots of ways that we can understand the water quality or quantity moving through here, um, whether it's flow rate, but we can also look at the size of gravel and that will tell us ultimately what kind of fish are going to be able to uh, spawn in gravel like this. The weir was slowing down the water. Yeah and actually causing the gravel to stop, stop, to drop out when it hit that, that fast move, when that fast moving water hit something and slowed it down. Thank you. That's how ultimately, you know, that's why we want large wood in our streams. That's why we want lots of structure in our streams. We don't want our streams to just be straight and fast because we want the ability to have this gravel sort out and we want to make sure we keep the small stuff so that some of our salmon species like coho and steelhead can have the right size gravel. How many stuff. fish are in the river? That's a good question. Uh, 
you know, we're having a, a, a pretty low run this year so far. So this year, you know, because of the fact that the rains have been late to come, the, really the, the fish haven't moved up, are just now starting to punch through. So, you know, I was um, doing some snorkeling up on up higher in Drift Creek where normally there's a bunch of fish and right now there's not not really many up there. I assume by the end of this weekend they'll probably be a move, move up. You know, back in the day when we were here, we could have come down here in this whole area. I mean, fish would have probably been spying right there, you know, spying under that. You know, this is a good one of the most vexing non-native invasive species that we'll we'll talk a lot about the impacts on water quality that some of these plants have. This plant right here is reef marygrass. And what do you guys notice is how the edge of the riverbank over here. It's like falling apart. It's starting to erode. It's actually calving off. It's actually sliding off completely. Whereas what do you notice about this side? It's sturdy. It's sturdy. Exactly. So you can see not only does this plant suck all the water out in the summertime from the stream bank and actually some of that cold water that in the summertime would still be coming leaching slowly out of the earth gets sucked up by this plant uh, because its root system is really big and dense and ultimately it you know in the summertime when it's growing like crazy it's taking all the water out of out of the uh, cold water refugia and seeps and then ultimately because it doesn't it has big fat roots, but they're not very deep. What it does is it doesn't actually hold the bank together. So, what you know, and we'll do this later in the year. Um, is we'll do some plantings actually, where you have to do things like take cuttings of that willow right there and actually plug them into the bank in order to make this uh, try and turn back into that. Because willow is one of the only things that can actually compete with the reef canary grass. So. Um, I just want to, you know, get you guys thinking a little bit about just because it's green doesn't always mean it's good. And especially when it comes to water quality, you know, there's a lot of non-native invasive species that, you know, don't do anything to help our water quality. They actually hurt the system just by being there um, and, fit and occupying the space that another plant like our native plants do a much better job at holding the earth together. They're much deeper rooted as well as they are much better suited um, for keeping, uh, keeping the ecosystem intact. So um, a lot of other, you know, in the, with the case of these trees right here, lots of birds will also use them. You know, there's a whole, not, you know, in addition to the fish, there's also a whole host of organisms um, that love hanging out in these woods.